this, 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 this show is brought to you by Safety FM. Hi listeners, this is Brent Sutton. Welcome to the 37th episode of the Practice of Learning Teams. On today's podcast, we take learning teams to the next level. When I think about health and safety awards and recognition, I'm always a bit concerned that we recognise good work and the very next day something happens and all that good work and recognition becomes negative. It makes us feel that if we celebrate success, we are welcoming failure into the room. Today is different, and one that is worthy of both celebration and recognition. Today I am joined by an amazing team of people from Chevron, who have been embedding learning teams across the organisation in many countries. Prior to COVID-19, this group of individuals received the Chevron Chairman's Award from Chevron CEO Michael Wirth for their outstanding effort in promoting a learning culture through the development and deployment of learning teams. I am joined today by three of the original group of seven that developed the learning team tool for Chevron. In this two-part series, we will explore their journey of embedding learning teams and explore not only how learning teams have been deployed both in and outside of safety, but also how learning teams have enriched the lives of workers both in and out of work. Please join me with Brent Robinson as we explore learning teams the Chevron way of Learn, Soak and Improve with Hymena, Chelsea and Eric. Thank you so much for inviting us. Uh, this is such a great opportunity to be talking about learning teams. My name is Jimena Gutierrez. I've been working for Chevron for 14 years and I'm currently in Midland, Texas um, doing some support in the HSC space, uh, health, safety and environment as a team lead for North America East, so for our fuels and lubricants business um, in the U.S. That is currently my job, but I've been a passionate uh, advocate of HOP, and I do in my spare time and in my regular everyday work, a lot of human and organizational performance, including learning teams. Hi, everybody. I am Chelsea Miller. I'm uh, currently an HSC team lead for our fuels and lubricants uh, plants in the West. So in California, Oregon, and Utah, I'm based out of Salt Lake City, Utah. And just like Amena said, I have a passion for hop and operational learning. So very excited to be with you today. Yeah, thank you for the invitation. Uh, My name is Eric Schwartz. I'm a human and organizational performance advisor uh, for the health, safety and environmental group uh, based out of the Chevron Technical Center. Uh, So my group is actually in Houston, but I'm based out of California uh, and I've been with Chevron for five years and uh, a lot of passion, as Chelsea and Jimena said, around all the stuff with the hop and human and organizational performance and learning teams and and V&V and field execution too and just systems thinking and so many other things. Uh, It's just super interesting and uh, and just can't wait to have a good uh, discussion with you guys and thank you for having me again. Well, look, and thank you. And we're also very lucky today that I'm also joined from Brent Robinson from Melbourne. It's a, it's a lovely, delightful early morning for Brent Robinson. Brent likes hitting me up early. <laughs> um, but it's amazing. So so guys, look, sh- share with the audience a story. I mean, first, first of all, a Chairman's Award. What an amazing recognition. That must, that must be very special. So talk to us a little bit about how that Chairman's Award came about. Oh my God, I think that that was a very very awesome surprise uh, that happened in December of 2019, (laughs) just before the pandemic, uh, that uh, 10 of us were recognized for the effort of supporting the organization and building a learning culture. And what really happened is that we were a core team of individuals, basically from the field in different uh, areas in the field that were interested in developing something a tool that would help chevron with with what we were hearing from outside the company about learning teams we're like what is that that is so interesting can we use that 
you know, what does good look like? And we were able to think about it, test it, and create something that worked for us. We call it Chevronize. <laughs> so we Chevronized learning teams. And, and that's what we did. And, 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 and we got a, eventually a, a chairman's award for it, which was pretty awesome. That's great. So you get this great group of people that have got together. Effectively, you're in a learning team to develop a chevronized learning team. Would that be the nice way of calling it? Pretty much. Yeah. But like, <laughs> and, like, yeah. And are you, were the 10 right across the whole country? Are they all in different locations? They were located all throughout the world. We had, oh, wow. gosh, Jimena, you and Mauricio were Colombia. We had uh, Roland in in the Philippines, Philippines. We had, yeah, we had folks, um, yeah, the majority were in the US, but still located at, you know, all of our various refineries, Eric at El Segundo, we had Stephen in Pascagoula and Shelly in Richmond. So everybody was sprinkled all over the place. Wow. So it was a truly global development of a learning team. Yeah, and Chevron is such a big company, right? That rather than each business unit or each organization sort of going in its own direction, right? Like in, in a silo, developing its approach to learning teams, you know, it, the thought was to bring together a, a core team to really decide how Chevron wanted to do learning teams as a, as a company, as an organization. And that was the benefit of, of getting folks from a bunch of different BUs, a bunch of different organizations to come together. And we were all excited to be there, right? Like it didn't even feel like work. We all had so much passion. And Eric, you should talk about it a little bit. I mean, it just felt so natural. No, it did. I mean, even we laughed about it because when we got together, uh, now Jimena can talk about it, and, and they did um, in a certain area of the corporation had already started piloting learning teams even before we got together and, and all met up. Um, we heard about all the great things, right? So it just, it just um, like really sparked that fire to, to do more. But um, yeah, to Chelsea's point too is we all got together and met at a location and like it didn't even seem like work, right? Because we're all talking about this exciting stuff that had already happened and then our plans. And there were so many great things going on. Like it didn't feel like we were working uh, at, at all, right? Because it was just so interesting, and we knew there was a, a value there. Uh, so it was it was just fun working with everybody. And we did some exercises and talked about some things and had some ideas. And it was kind of funny because we all kind of went back to our respective business units. And I can't speak for everybody else, but um, I told everybody back when I came back to, to El Segundo, um, like, yeah, this great stuff. And, and I'm, I was on this little team for this exercise. And then all of a sudden I get an email that, um, yeah, like you're on the team and this is the next plan and this is what we're doing. It's like, oh, it wasn't an exercise. We're doing this. <laughs> um, so it was cool. It was even more exciting to know that they were that serious about it. And it kind of just went from there. So I'm not going to keep blabbing, but, and we can talk more specifics, but yeah, it was, it was great, great journey so far and great to continue it on too. That's great. So, so why do you think people are so hesitant when learning becomes so natural? Ooh, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> That's it, a good a, question. It's, it's scary, isn't it? It's like, it's like that, because it, they think it's a leap of faith, but in actual fact, it's just a step. You know, I've been thinking about that so much lately, and I think that the scary part of learning is the additional work that it takes to implement what you learned, right? And if we talk about the hop mindset, that is not about just behavior, but developing resilient systems and error tolerance systems, we're talking about work, right? You got to make changes, you got to invest in certain things that will help long term for people to be successful. And learning comes with <laughs> the majority of the times with action. And I think that's what people avoid. They have so much on their plate that it's like, ooh, yeah. <laughs> I don't want to go there. Have something extra, right, Jimena? Absolutely. <laughs> they think it's like, oh wait, you want me to work and learn, like, but like they don't even realize that like they're actually already doing it at the same time, and that was ended up being more of it is just trying to help people understand they were already kind of doing it, uh, but they never had a platform or a space or even like the ability to. And it's not like anybody was um, inhibiting them or telling them not to. But we just didn't have that space for it to support it, you know? 
Yeah, and I think and we, we use the language, it's, a, it's about that shift between what we call unintentional learning, mm-hmm. which is what the, the workers are facing every day, versus deliberate learning, where you're basically creating that space, that space of people to actually actively think about the learning that's occurred. It doesn't, and it doesn't really take a lot of time. It's just getting that shift in that mindset from that sort of unintentional thing and making it more of a deliberate action. But, but we and do some, hear, sorry, go for it. Oh, sorry, Brennan. I was just going to say, sometimes we get in our own way because we're so married to our processes, right? And they, they, our processes and our systems just don't evolve as quickly as a lot of times our thinking does, right? And so when, when HOP, when human and organizational performance was first sort of introduced in Chevron, people were going, yeah, I get this. I, I get this philosophical shift. I get this lens. I can start, I, I start seeing things differently, but then they were going, well, but I still have this, you know, archaic way of doing incident investigations that lead me to some of the same root causes, right? Procedure not followed and hazard not identified. And we just, we didn't have at the time a a way to be different. We didn't have a learning team yet. We didn't have a safeguard learning tool. We didn't have, we started thinking differently. Yeah, we just didn't have a mechanism. And so when this, you know, just for example, when this team, this learning team team came together and you know the the team that got the chairman's award that was our goal right let's give chevron a mechanism a way to to start doing something differently Mm -hmm. i think all of us had a good visibility too of like many different tools that that even already existed that we didn't realize we could just kind of tweak and adapt to to turn it into a learning tool right even post job reviews that was more just like well if we have time or if something was really significant but other than that, if ever if we got five people in the morning and five people in the afternoon, then that's a win. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, so I think there's, there's two things. We, we we hear it quite often that uh, organizations start to become concerned about the amount of learnings. And as though that's, that might act as a barrier. And, and it's really interesting because that learning is happening regardless. Yep. The question here is, do you want visibility of the learning? Just, just because it's a learning doesn't mean it actually needs to lead to some form of organizational action. And, and a lot of times we talk about the fact that there is what workers learn versus what the organization learns. And we're really wanting uh, workers to use that learning process, that reflective process that you, you guys call it soak time. Your tagline is learn, soak, improve. We, we were talking about things like about, you know, learn, reflect, and, 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 and apply because it's mm-hmm. about that whole sort of that notion. But ultimately it's about those those work teams self-improving yep. through their own mechanisms and how the organization can support them rather than saying, look, we, here's our learnings. Mr. Organization, can you please now do something with them? So where do you think that disconnect comes from? I think that you bring an excellent point in that um, learning teams has been an avenue for people to recognize that the learning occurs most of the time at the worker level and 90% of the actions associated could be uh, done by the worker themselves, right? Just a tweak in the way that they do things out there, right? Or the recognition of something that they, they didn't know the day before. Um, and that is what really helped us take learning teams to the next level was to really recognize that we have moved our mindset to the worker being the problem, to the worker supporting in the solution of that problem, right? Um, and it grasped so bad that, or, or, or so awesome, that people wanted to do it, right? People wanted to just experience learning. Uh, they saw it was quick, they saw it was efficient, they saw the change at the worker level of the perception of how does the organization help me be successful in my job? And I think that that has help demonstrate the people that have used the tool that that's what we're intending to do right so 
when you see, when you still have people that do not want to mm, accept that mindset or that way of looking at things it's because i don't think they have seen the impact at the worker level of what we're trying to accomplish so are you saying that the workers really got on board pretty quickly from your experience mm -hmm. yes oh day one Yeah. yeah. They're the ones saying, let's just, you know, sit down and do a learning team about it. Yeah. They're the ones saying it. Because they've got a voice now. Yeah, precisely. It's been yeah. a big pull in Chevron. We always talk about this push pull concept, right? And learning teams in Chevron were a massive pull. You know, it was not a top down, thou shalt be different, thou shalt embody these five hot principles and ask questions differently. It was the, it, everybody just sort of latched on and it was a big pull. And what, and it's interesting because when we first started in this journey, you know, with folks like Bob Edwards and Andrea Baker, um, Andrea talked to us about learning teams as being the Trojan horse, right? And I, at the time I sort of was like, yeah, okay. I totally get it now, right? Because <laughs> learning teams came into Chevron culture and just started chipping away at this, at our culture, right? And really started helping us become this learn and improve obsessed culture, right? Yeah. And, and learning teams were just this one tool, the, the first tool that we started to implement, but then it just took off from there. And now we talk about it as like this overarching operational learning tools, right? Mm -hmm. How can we learn from the blue line? And what are all the ways that we can do that? And we become less focused on the, the checking the box and the documentation of it all. And it just becomes this continuous feedback loop. Do you think that uh, Chevron leadership needed the, the hot principles to be able to listen to what was coming up from the, from the worker level? Was that important? Because sometimes we see that rub where, you know, there's some really cool stuff going on from the workers, but they, um, you know, some information comes out and then the leadership might not be ready to receive what they're being told sometimes. I think that that was a, a true statement, right? Uh, we had we had Todd Conklin come back to maybe 2013 to Chevron and telling us, you know, this is this is a good way of looking at things and uh, and showing us the importance and giving us good examples of why we should be thinking differently and guiding us to it but we couldn't make sense of how to get that done really at least in the operational learning side of it until we got a grasp of learning teams yeah, right yeah. that was the tool that really helped us with the how this is how those principles work right this is how you're able to ask different questions. This is how you're able to engage the worker. Um, so, so we were able to connect the dots from what Todd was telling us and it made all the sense of the world. And when Bob Edwards helped us, uh, Andrea Baker also helped us really uh, shape what learning teams should look like for us as a company. That's, uh, yeah, it's, I like that term, a Trojan horse, because we see that quite a bit, that, you know, <laughs> you, you start off with this thing and people go, oh, wow, hold on, there's this really cool thing that just happened. And, you know, Brent and I and Glynis will talk about this. Sometimes it's not even about safety, it can be about productivity. You know, yeah. the workers have found yeah. a really cool way of doing something. And, you know, I've come from a lean back background and, you know, you go, well, this is actually really cool because it's so, so much more um, sort of organic and yeah. then and, and, and what comes up And you go, wow, we never saw that. You know, and if we put this bridges. strict process around it, like, you know, did you guys have that same experience? It bridges, it, it yeah. transcends all of those different topics, right? I mean, learning teams uh, helped us just ask leading questions, open ended questions, involve the people that do the work. Gosh, what a novel concept, yes. right? Yeah. And, you know, it, and we also learned that learning teams help build true accountability, right? That, you know, once I feel, once once somebody comes to me and says, Chelsea, what's 
what's going on in your world? What are your issues? What are your vulnerabilities? What are you facing? And then I'm also asked how to make it better, how to fix it. I don't feel of like I'm a victim, right? I don't feel like I'm part of, uh, you know, a victim of the situation. I am empowered to, to share what's going on and also make it better. So it's it's pulling, mm -hmm. it's it's building that true accountability. And you know, I would also just add that you know, Chevron out the gate, you know, we we had this team that put all this structure and and process around how to do a learning team, right? But we also are backing away from that structure as the years go on, right? Because the goal is to, to just embed this, this way of doing things into everything we do. It becomes a lens, right? How can we engage differently? And Eric has been so much involved in that work, how to ask better questions, how to in involve people that do the actual activity and task. So it doesn't have to be this so structured as, as, as maybe we were with learning teams out the gate. It comes in and it helps us have a different lens and have a different approach for everything. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's a really valid point because, because what we see in a lot of work that we're trying to do is that the, the very virtue and nature of a learning team is its organic component. But for many people, that's the biggest barrier because it's foreign to them. And, and and that foreign component creates uncertainty and uncertainty drives certain behaviors. So one of the things that we've been trying to focus on, and, and I think what you guys are really talking about is that you have to give people a pathway to bridge between their current world and this new world. And it's not about a timeline, it's simply about them seeing the, being able to reflect themselves and seeing that organic growth that occurs. And, and, oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, a lot of people use think tools as being a dirty word. You know, here's a here's a tool. I mean, we we we, we personally we call them guiding frameworks because that's more of a learning type approach. Does that make sense? We want to guide a person along um, because we want them to sort of you know pick it up and then become their own. And I think that's really what you guys have achieved. It's actually taking it from from this from the structure into this. Um, unstructured environment because now the person has that capacity to understand what that free-flying organic narrative can do and we started we started doing that structure back in april of 2016 when we started doing this micro experiment with with the concept of learning teams and we were scratching our heads saying uh, how do we chevronize this? And, and you know, Bob Edwards and Todd Conkling, they were all super specific telling us, do not make it more complex than what it is. It's such a simple <laughs> method. It's just a way of thinking. It's just a way of engaging. Do not chevronize. I remember them saying, don't go over chevronizing the tool because you will make it more complex. And we, we, we try to stick to that principle of let's keep it simple, but we needed to give a structure so people could grasp just because of the culture that we have been in, right? We needed a mechanism to show people these would be the most simple steps that you would have to follow to be able to successfully get to the right piece of conversation to really get the story and get the context behind the facts, right? We were all about the context. They were telling us it's all about the story and we needed storytellers and we needed facilitators to unfold that story. So we created a very simple structure that it's it's very true what Chelsea is saying, we're getting out of the structure because we understood now, we understand now the purpose and the intention, you know, and, and, and the outcome of what we're trying to achieve. So it's not about the method, it's, it's about the story, right? And we're yeah. getting to, to get smarter on asking questions and involving the field. Mm -hmm. And people want linear, they, they love linear. Our, our brain is not gonna move away from linear. And, and, and I think, and that's why just recently, we, we talk about the fact that um, things can be linear, just put a, a different context. So, so, so things, like, things like a narrative ladder. So, so, so think about, it's just like one step, or, or we call, in adult education, we call it scaffolding. Mm -hmm. How can we scaffold between those levels? But all right. you're doing is, is, is a storytelling. It's, it's how, well, for instance, you know, when we wrote our book, that's how we wrote our book. 
we 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 had our um, scaffold, and that created our narrative. So, are, what are the same? Yeah, and there's absolutely certain scenarios and situations where you want to use a more linear methodology or, or, or to have, you know, there's purely mechanical pump failures out there, right? That, that you can, that you can study from a linear angle and get to the root causes and figure out how to get better for that purely mechanical failure. But when there's humans involved and when there's, cro you know, even cross-functional teams and machines, I mean, it becomes incredibly complex. Right. And a taproot and a Y tree just can't is not the right tool for those situations. And so we need something that can really appreciate and involve and, and let let the complexity be part of that conversation. Right. Let it unfold. And tools like a learning team and tools like uh, post job review, or, you know, those expose and those highlight the complexity. So it's, it's oh, that, 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 that visibility, the transparency that we're, we're all wanting. Yeah, we always talk about it as a toolbox. Yeah. It, there's, there's, and you don't have to be a, a, you know, you don't have to be an expert in all the different tools. You just have to go to somebody and say, here's the situation that I have. Um, what, what do you think is the best tool to, to learn about this to, to improve, to improve how we do it? And Lean Sigma, learning teams, safer learning tools. In traditional investigations are all there. Can, can we, uh, look, when we're writing a book, we 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 sort of um, uh, broke a cardinal rule. We we introduced um, root cause analysis into event-based learning teams because what we said was that we we wanted that brainstorming, wanted we wanted that free flow narrative to occur, but we also needed some construct mm -hmm. around root cause. But we changed it. We changed root cause to be a reflective process rather than a classification you know where does it fit in the root cause which is how a lot of times it was being used so i absolutely agree with what you guys are saying we, we still need these things but we can use them in a whole different way um organizations still want to classify things they, they still like having some form of metric I, I don't know why we think metrics are, are, are dirty or, or sort of you know what I mean yeah. I mean they're going to be there um but I absolutely agree that when we think about the complexity of the human component it's, it's about monitoring it's about creating visibility it's understanding when we're dealing with objects they're binary give it a good old you know linear process and that that hazard will respond to you but I think back to your point, Chelsea, that, you know, we can't have this linear view, but that's because machines can be quite linear. It's when the humans get interact with the machines that it's no longer linear anymore, right? It, it becomes this much more nebulous thing that we're now dealing with. One of the, um, I mean, you're saying that one of the things you mentioned, the word facilitator, did you choose facilitators? Did they choose themselves? How did you start getting, you know, this, we talk about this Trojan horse, so you needed some facilitators to spread it out and take it across your whole organization. How did that process happen? It's a very funny question because that's where we struggle the most to define what good looks like, right? We, we understood that it was an essential role, especially at the very beginning of learning teams because of the, what we're trying to accomplish of gathering the story. So you need to be asking different questions to get different answers. And we needed people with certain skills and capabilities, right? So we were, we were, should we pick people by role? Should we pick people by skill? If it's by skill, what type of skill are we looking for? And we actually ended up doing that, right? Let's pick people by hand, right? And by how motivated they are to help with this new mindset, uh, with really engaging and sympathizing with the workers. We wanted those people that are just generally curious to understand what the blue line looks like and and avoid the the comparing against the black line. And those people were the first that we grabbed right and we eventually as we were progressing in the amount of learning teams that we were doing 
we defined a second tier called the mentors. So, so we said those people that are have a little bit more experience in learning teams are going to be mentors of facilitators. Uh, so we were growing our community of facilitation by having these five, six, ten mentors across the globe uh, helping coach these facilitators and co-facilitating with them the majority of times until they understood what we were trying to accomplish. And now we have a community of maybe 150 plus facilitators uh, around the globe oh, wow. that that are helping us do that. Yep. Uh, and are they, sorry, are they from all levels of the business? Mm-hmm. Okay, wow. So, so out of interest, th- that new skill that they've gained, has that changed part of their other life? So, so using this within work, these new skills they've gained of reflecting and facilitating, have you got had any feedback from them about how that's changed their, their look at their view on life or or how they function? I always, I, I mean, gosh, I don't, I can only speak from like personal experience, but I could, I mean. Yes, absolutely. I mean, it's not like you are a different person at work than you are in your personal life, right? I mean, we are who we are. And once you start to get this hop lens and you really start to go, gosh, people make mistakes. Blame blame fixes nothing. Systems drive behavior. Uh, Response matters. You know, you start, you don't unsee that when you leave work, right? You start to view the world differently. And I, I do, I know I do. Right. And so what does that look like? Like, I don't know. I, 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 I'm, oh, more I, patient. I'm more patient with my mom, right. When she's driving me crazy <laughs> and you know, you, you try to give people the benefit of the doubt and you take a pause before you tell them exactly what you want to say. Right. Cause that's a reaction, not a response. So I hear that all the time from people that, when they really start to learn about hop and, 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 and apply it and embody it, like it's just not something you turn off and you turn on. It's right. a lens. So of course, big shout out to Chelsea's mum if she's tuning in to <laughs> iHeartRadio. <laughs> she's always my example. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true though. I mean, like I've become a better like listener, right? And, and even just the, just the fact of just listening and not talking but also like listening for key things, right? Like those weak signals that Bob always talked about. And like, normally we do this or well, sometimes, or we do that on Mondays. And, and those are just some examples, right? But to Chelsea's point too, and like, I'll take that home. And, and um, when I hear my kids or someone say things, like I don't just leave it at that, right? Like you dive deeper and, and ask for more understanding, right? In, In context behind things. And, and I've had people that I mentored too that said that that changed the way that they did other things at work as well, right? And, and investigations being one of them, right? Whether it was including a learning team or not, um, it was including those methodologies in a taproot or a 5Y or white tree, whatever. Because um, I, I truly believe that all those are good tools and it's kind of a side topic, but I think they're all good tools and it really comes down to the facilitator, you know? And, and then how that person takes those skills and those abilities from something great like hop and and learning teams and and looking at the world in a different way and applying it to so many different things you know Um, i have actually great i've recently been out in the field asking some of the supervisors of these facilitators (laughs) some of them are workers in the field and i asked the supervisors if they've seen a, a change in them and they said oh my god it's day and night right people that are engaged on the questions that are being asked, right? That they're not just trying to avoid the supervisor or get out the information as quick as possible. And the game, in the game of, I think I'm being audited, so I'll just give the least amount of information so I don't get in trouble. People are engaged in the conversation. They want to share the story, right? They want to, they want people to relate to the context of what is happening, right? And these people are helping others get to that point so so they're leading by example in the field and i think that that is really the the difference uh the improvement that we're seeing that we didn't really think through but it's happening and and the other thing you you mentioned brent was about the the lean sigma people we actually found at least in my business unit we found in the middle of this journey that we needed to bring those lean sigma people in 
and we we had them as facilitators there and as mentors because they have been the smartest yet in in the type of ask uh, questions that they're asking, right? So we're like, why don't we just leverage the the tools and and the skills that they have, and bring them in into learning teams and and show that we're all a true team trying to accomplish the same thing, right? That was another good thing that I think we did. Because there's a lot of similarity there, isn't there? You know, Deming Deming started off some of these things, boy, 50 years ago. And um, I, and that's why you know, people say it's this or it's that. I don't. I just see the things merging together. You know, right? and that's what I love about it. No, hundred percent. We, we, we have the same thing. We have the same thing. Yeah, go ahead, thing. Eric. Oh no, yeah, we have the same thing in Lean Sigma. And I'm glad that I know Hemant has told me that before too. But yeah, that we actually reached out to each other when we started seeing these things be more visible. I was like, well, like we see some synergy here. <laughs> uh, we should probably talk to each other, right? And especially for some of the projects that maybe didn't need to be a kaizen or something longer. Yeah, uh, maybe we could do a learning team, right? Or those learning teams could surface other Lean Sigma projects or the Lean Sigma projects could surface some other learning teams. So that was great too. And then also lastly, I'm gonna pass it to you, Chelsea, is um, seeing other people come in and there's that industrial empathy, right? When people respect each other and Bob talks about it, when an operator is talking to a mechanic or an engineer across the table and they really understand what they're going through. But then to see people days later, like in a control room, and they're like, hey, man, like that was really cool what we did yesterday in that learning team. And and now I'm incorporating that like in our start of shift meetings and, and really just and like not maybe not that lengthy and they're not, not not two sessions or anything, but incorporating the methodology. So it was cool to see them making it their own. Um, yeah. There's so much tremendous value in that, you know. And I think that's really important because I, I think like everything, um, learning creates empowerment. And in all good adult learning, that, that's its objective is to empower people because, you know, they, they, they get a greater sense of themselves. And, and certainly what we're seeing is that um, we're doing a lot more work where we're uh, doing what are called uh, worker-led narrative, where it's not does not look like a traditional learning team, but we're providing them with a guiding frame to have that rich narrative and then to be able to capture that narrative so that the organization can try and make sense of it. Because, you know, we talk about, you know, if we think about what's happening every day, that's that's where we can see the similarity between things is what's happening every day. But we can't take a traditional learning team and use that in that everyday environment because it becomes overwhelming. And, and, and that's a lot of what we're seeing at the moment. Please join us next week for episode 38 as we can continue our discussion with Hymena, Chelsea and Eric and the Chevron way of doing learning teams of Learn, Soak and Improve. Thank you listeners for being part of this podcast. We would love to hear your learnings or other topics you would like us to explore about learning teams. Go to www.podcastlearnings.com and give us your feedback. Become part of the community of practice with learning teams. Go to www.learningteamscommunity.com, support the authors of the practice of learning teams, purchase the book from amazon.com or go to www.learningteamsbook.com for an inside look and other free book resources from the authors. The views and opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the host and its guest and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the company. Examples of analysis discussed within this podcast are only examples. They should not be utilized in the real world as the only solution available as they are based only on very limited and dated open source information. Assumptions made within this analysis are not reflective of the position of the company. No part of this podcast may be reproduced, stored in a retrieval system, or transmitted in any form or by any means, mechanical, electronic, recording, or otherwise, without prior written permission of the creator of the podcast, Jay Allen.